Thank you, Tomas. Uh, as you said, my name is John Utrol. I work as a group manager for uh, one of our software devel development teams here at Business Unit Enebus. I've uh, been involved in the OPC UA implementations on our compact modules, for example. Uh, so uh, I will give you a 20 minutes introduction to OPC UA. Uh, it will not be that technical in a, the in a lower level. Uh, maybe if you've seen uh, the MQTT tech talk with Daniel Rosin two weeks ago, uh, that was very much into the bits and bytes of the protocol. Uh, with OPC UA, the protocol is much bigger, much more to, to uh, uh, talk about. So I will do it in a little bit higher uh, overview and talk about the building blocks uh, of it instead. Um, and actually talking about MQTT, this is something we will actually see in this presentation uh, we'll coming to the end as well. So going through the agenda, this is the topics I will address today, uh, starting with some background and introduction, uh, going through object and data modeling, uh, services, uh, transport options, uh, security and information models. I will do an, uh, show you an application example with some of our products, uh, and I will talk about the new extension PubSub, uh, which has come into the OPC UA uh, specification uh, lately, and talk about the, the use cases behind that. Uh, uh, I will give a brief uh, uh, at the end uh, summary of what I think makes OPC UA unique and special, and we will. Uh, Finish up with the Q&A session, so if you have any questions, uh, use the Q&A uh, tool in WebEx, and uh, Thomas will ask them in the end. So, starting with the background of an OPC. Uh, OPC, uh, as a protocol, has been around since 95. Uh, the first version of the protocol, uh, which is now called OPC Classic, uh, was very tight, uh, tightly uh, connected into Microsoft Windows. It uses the com DCOM uh, communication library uh, that was only available for, for Windows. So uh, that was one of the big disadvantages with that protocol. It was very tight to get to on, on that platform. Um, typical use case for it was to have a communication from a manufacturing uh, floor, from a PLC, uh, for example. You want to have the data in the PLC available to multiple devices on your control network. Uh, and at that time, uh, you maybe just had a proprietary uh, driver in your computer that can talk to the PLC, uh, and through that you can fetch up information and make that available over UPC to, to uh, multiple uh, clients on the network. Uh, the protocol, uh, both classic and UA, is uh, client-server based, uh, so the client makes a request and the server sends back a response. Um, one of the biggest changes with OPC UA is that it's not tied connect tied to uh, Microsoft Windows and more, so it's a platform independent implementation. So now you can run OPC UA on your uh, device, uh, regardless of it, if it's running Windows or not. Um, so the OPC Foundation, uh, they had all the problems with OPC Classic, but they wanted to build on the success of it. Uh, so they initially wanted to say this, solve the same problem, uh, but they wanted the protocol to be platform independent. Uh, they want to have security built into the protocol and make the data modeling capabilities very much more flexible. Uh, and they also wanted to be able to extend the protocol using different information models. So they started the work of defining the protocol in 2003. Uh, it was released in 2009. Uh, it was standardized with IEC 62541 in 2012. Uh, UA is not backward compatible with OPC Classic, but there is some migration path. So if you want to go from Classic to UA, it's possible, uh, but you need to do some changes. Um, so I will start with uh, talking a bit about the basic building blocks of OPC UA. And you see in the picture here, we have the base of the protocol that is quite strictly uh, defined and the very information models on top. Uh, so I will talk uh, on, the, on the bottom. Uh, base of the of the protocol that to start with here, and I will start with uh, talking about the object model. Uh, the object model is more complex than OPC UA than you're used to. If, if you are working with industrial Ethernet uh, protocols today, 
uh, maybe you have a list of parameters. You can maybe group your parameters into different groups, but basically that's it. Uh, with OPC UA, you have a much more complex uh, object model. Uh, it's very much like an object-oriented program programming language. So it's a class in C++ almost. Uh, so, so this object it can have variables, it can perform services, it can reference other objects to build a complex representation of a device, and it can also trigger notifications and events. And if you break this down, everything is built up on nodes within an address space of a server. So each uh, server has their own address space, uh, and their, their address space contains uh, nodes which reference each other. And there are seven uh, fixed uh, node types to use. Uh, you have node types for uh, describing different types. Uh, so you can make your own object types, so your own data types, and describe them uh, in OPC. And then you can instantiate these uh, using other types of nodes. So these seven fixed node types you have in the middle here. And you can have relationships between uh, these nodes to build up objects and build up bigger, uh, the whole object model of the device. And there was also a defined graphical way how to represent this that is specified in the OPC UA specification. For, for, and we have an example here for, for a data model. On, on the bottom side here, we have the uh, type definition for an object. Uh, in this uh, example here, it's called an analog measurement object type. And the object type defines which variables uh, an object of this type should have, uh, and also which kinds of uh, uh, method it, it has that it can it can um, it can call. Uh, can also say that some parameters are mandatory to implement and some are optional. And on the top side here we have instances of these object types. So we have three of them. We have pressure and we have two temperatures. Uh, and you can see that they are referencing down to the object type. Uh, uh, so there is a, a way for a client uh, who finds this object instance for pressure, and he wants to know how should this object look like. And there is a re reference right in the object model how to find the, the object type and to read out the information about that. So it's quite. Uh, the device contains uh, not only uh, the data and the parameters, uh, it also uh, holds the entire uh, object model and descri describes the object model in a good way, uh, which makes it very much easier for a, a client to interpret and parse the data mm -hmm. and represent it uh, nicely to, to a human user. Uh, one other part of the base of the, pro uh, of the protocol is uh, the server services uh, that is available. There are a fixed number of services. Uh, so that services for discovery servers and endpoints in devices. You can open up secure channels. Uh, you can browse the address space of the device. Uh, you can read and write data. Uh, and you can uh, do subscriptions. You can uh, subscribe on changes on a parameter or an object. Uh, so you will get notified when the data changes. Uh, there are also something called call methods, uh, that's basically like calling a subroutine in the device. So you can send it to, to, to start a process or do a, some kind of logic in your device. And this is also a way to tunnel in uh, vendor-specific services. If you want to have a specific service that is not available uh, in the base uh, of the OPC UA uh, protocol. Um, there are different ways to transport uh, data to and from a server. Uh, there is one mandatory that all servers must implement. Uh, it's running on top of TCP IP, and it has a, a binary, a optimized binary data encoding scheme. So it's uh, easier for a memory constrained smaller device to handle than, for example, an XML uh, data encoding style. Uh, TCP IP is not a secure transport, so uh, OPC had to implement their own end-to-end uh, -end security uh, layer, so it's something called UA Secure Communication Layer that has been added here. And um, the, the advantage with that is that it's quite easy to move out uh, TCP IP and uh, run on some other transport 
and the transport does not need to be secured. It can be secured by the UA protocol itself. Uh, there are also uh, um, uh, transport options running on top of HTTPS, uh, and these are uh, good to use for when you're doing cloud connections, for example, because the HTTPS is very firewall friendly. And uh, the data encoding schemes using XML, XML is easier to use maybe in a, a, a PC or a Linux system, uh, but for a memory constrained device, uh, a binary encoding is, is much easier. So every server must implement this UA binary over TCP. Uh, it can uh, choose to implement more if they want, and the client can also um, choose to implement uh, one or more of these. So uh, that was the base of the uh, pro uh, protocol. Uh, when looking at the information model on top of it, uh, there are four predefined data models, uh, data access, uh, alongs and conditions, historical access, and programs. And if you used to OPC Classic, uh, you uh, maybe have heard of some of these data access, for example. Uh, the, the information models are derived from here and improved from OPC Classic. Uh, there are also something called companion specifications. Uh, and they are used for uh, different vertical industries. Uh, to be able to uh, define how a specific machine should be represented on OPC UA. Uh, so the industry can come together uh, along with OPC UA and do a joint uh, working group and define how a specific robot should function and how that should be uh, represented on OPC UA. And then this companion specification will be released alongside with the uh, UA specification from the OPC Foundation. But if there are no information models uh, for your type of device, you can also do a vendor-specific information model. So now we're moving in. I will show you a quick application example here. Uh, first, I want to introduce some of the products uh, that I will show in the application example. Uh, these are three uh, HMS products uh, with, which have uh, OPC UA servers embedded in them. To the left here, we have the E1 Flexi. Uh, the Flexi connects to a PLC uh, to get the tags and data from PLC available for a cloud service, for example. Uh, it's also used for making the PLC uh, remote connectable. So uh, it will be uh, possible to do remote maintenance and the remote configuration of the PLC through this uh, gateway. Um, the latest addition to the E1 Flexi is that they have added a OPC UA server. Uh, so the PLC tags on the PLC is now available on OPC UA on the local network. And uh, it can be distributed using the data access information model. In the middle here, we have the Anibus X gateway. It was released one or two months ago. Uh, it can uh, translate from a wide variety of different network protocols to OPC UA. Uh, so you can run, for example, control net. So you can have Ethernet IP on the on one side of the gateway, uh, and on the other side we have OPC UA. So, so we can get information from these uh, networks. It could be a new fancy industrial Ethernet networks, so it could be really old legacy networks, and you can still get the data to OPC UA on these networks. And they also have the compact module, which uh, I've been involved in the. Um, uh, in developing. Uh, here we have added OPC UA server uh, on the side of the industrial Ethernet protocol. So we're still using Ethernet IP or ProfNet for controlling the application, uh, but there is an OPC UA server available uh, so we can uh, get additional data from the application uh, pushed to higher systems. Uh, for example, we, we have a welding controller. You, you control uh, web, the welding robot using Ethernet IP. But when you do the weld, there is a lot of diagnostic data that is available in the application. And that kind of data can be very interesting to have stored in an IT system for, for quality analysis in the future. And that kind of data could be transferred using OPC UA uh, up to the IT systems. So here's an application example. Uh, on the lower left, we have the E1 Flexi connected to uh, PLC, uh, 
getting uh, tags from the PLC available to the control network and have the OPC Ray server on the control network. In the middle, we have the NBUS X gateway. Uh, it translates uh, information and data from the control net network uh, to OPC Ray, uh, and have us has an OPC Ray server on the control network. On the lower right, uh, we have a system where we have devices who are natively talking OPC Ray. So there are the PLC in this example has OPC Ray uh, uh, implemented natively, so it can talk directly OPC Ray. There are also a motor drive here that has that capability. Um, so in the middle of here, the, the, the yellow um, area, we have a HMI on the left. Uh, which is an OPC UA client, so it fetches data from uh, from the flex and the gateway and the devices uh, on the um, on the network that is uh, capable of talking OPC UA. Uh, there is also an historian to the to the right here, which is a client. Um, moving up, you can send data upwards to to the cloud or something similar on your prem solution. Uh, you can connect to MindSphere using a Mind Connect box. Uh, the Mind Connect box has an OPC UA client which fetches data from the network and sends it up to the MindSphere. Uh, Microsoft Azure has uh, OPC UA built in already into the cloud, so you can talk OPC UA uh, over internet. Uh, for this example, you can also use the, the E1 Flexi to directly send data to the cloud. But in this example, we wanted to show the, the OPC UA uh, way of uh, sending data. So the next uh, or the last uh, real topic I want to address here today is the new extension to OPC UA. It's called PubSub. It stands for Publish and Subscribe. And uh, it solves uh, the problem when there is uh, one device want to send or make data available to many others. Um, if we have, like in this example, a PLC or a, even a more memory constrained device, uh, which uh, there are hundreds and maybe thousands of OPC clients that is uh, interesting in, in data values from this server, uh, the, the small little server needs to be able to cope with all these connections to all clients. And that's not really realistic. Um, so there are two different use cases here. The first one is when you want to push uh, data to uh, something that is not on your network. Uh, it could be all the way out to the cloud. And in that example, OPC UA PubSub will use some kind of middleware uh, to help out with the distribution of the of the of the of the packets and in the data. So in this example. Uh, the, the OPC UA devices that is interesting in the data from the PLC here, they can register to the middleware and say, I will subscribe to data from, from this device. And uh, when the PLC uh, has a data change, you can push up the data to the middleware, and the middleware handles the distribution to the other uh, OPC UA uh, receivers on the network. And this is where MQTT actually comes in, because uh, MQTT is one of these and middleware that is defined for the new PubSub in OPC UA. So actually, you're running OPC UA on top of MQTT here. And you can also uh, use AMQP, which is a similar protocol. AMQP is also uh, very widely implemented in different uh, cloud applications. So you, you have the possibility to use AMQP to connect to a lot of cloud solutions. The other use case, uh, which also is a one-to-many uh, use case, uh, but this is in a local network uh, when you want to keep the, the data in a, a smaller network, in the same subnet, for example. Uh, this use case is a more machine-to-machine -machine use case. It could be a controller-to-controller, or like in this case, from a controller to uh, slave devices, like motor controllers and other types of sensors and actuators. And um, this uh, technique uh, targeting more the manufacturing devices, just uh, like in this example I have here. Uh, if you publish this data and start doing it cyclically, 
it, it's quite similar to doing IO connections on uh, on, uh, on like Ethernet IP. It also uses uh, UDP multicast uh, on the same subnet to and do that cyclically to control devices. Uh, so using this technology, you can and do it cyclically. You can almost uh, do the same thing as some of the industrial protocols that we have today. One of the problems with with today's Ethernet is that it's not deterministic, so you can't really predict when when you publish a, a, a packet when it will arrive on the other end. And there are there are other industrial Ethernet protocols that have this problem, and uh, all of them are uh, looking at uh, implementing something called time sensitive networks (TSN). And TSN is actually a set of new IEEE standards uh, that will change the Ethernet in the, uh, from the ground and up. So, so you will have like an Ethernet 2.0, 2.0 with new capabilities that will solve these deterministic problems that we have today. So uh, TSN uh, can do something like bandwidth allocations. So you can make sure there are bandwidth available for so certain type of uh, traffic. You can time slice network to ensure that uh, packets will be received. Uh, there will be uh, bandwidth available exactly when you need to send your data to from one point to another. And it also includes uh, uh, high uh, time synchronization within the network. So the OPC Foundation has actually uh, started a, a few more working groups in this area here to, to look at how can they use this kind of technology for real-time communication. So that will be something that will be interesting for us to follow here in the future. So this is uh, my last slide here before we move over to the Q&A session. Uh, I want to highlight the features of OPC Red that I think makes it uh, unique. Uh, first of all, it's the data modeling and the security that is built into the to the protocol, and um, there it has advantage over other industrial Ethernet protocol uh, protocols like Ethernet IP and Propnet are now looking at adding security, uh, and the data models is not they are always uh, uh, requiring to have. Uh, information or, or knowledge about how the, the device works to be able to interpret the data in a good way. You, you, you like you need to have EDS files, for example, for the for Ethernet IP devices, or you need to go to look at the manual to understand how to interpret the data that the device uh, actually uh, produces. Um, but with uh, OPC Ray, you have uh, your uh, data modeling. Uh, available already in the device. Uh, you have the security already built into protocol. And with this new PubSub and TSN, it can practically do the same thing as many other industrial Ethernet protocols. Uh, so we see that uh, OPC UA is widening, widening the market, not just from the PLC and upwards now, they're also from the PLC and down to end devices. Uh, so that will be interesting to see uh, how that will uh, which uh, type of markets uh, that that uh, protocol will take. There is one disadvantage with OPC way uh, in relation to other industrial Ethernet uh, protocols. Um, the communication market is very controlled by the PLC manufacturers. So you have like uh, Rockwell, they are doing all devices with Ethernet IP. Siemens is running everything on Profinet. And we don't really see that there we have any big PLC manufacturer behind the OPC UA at the moment. Uh, but that's something that could change uh, in the future.